Well, today marks the beginning of the season of Lent. And in the next 40 days, some amazing transformations will occur. Or not. Many of us want to change our lives, but our desires are often dashed. We dream and we hope and we predict that the future will be different for us with mixed results. The May 2015 issue of The Atlantic magazine had a list of some of the worst predictions of all time. Here are some of them. By the year 2000, war will be abolished. That was the prediction of the essayist in the Atlantic magazine at the start of the 20th century. That magazine also anticipated that the poor would be living in high-rise abodes of happiness and health. And around the same time, the Ladies' Home Journal predicted that mice and rats would be eliminated, along with the letters C, X, and Q. It's okay, you can laugh. It is kind of ludicrous. <clears throat> Here's another prediction. By the early 21st century, Mars will be colonized. This prediction was made by Ray Bradbury and he said it would occur due to a global nuclear war, which is interesting because war should have been abolished, right? Before his death in 2012, he claimed that his prediction didn't come true because we chose to be consumers. Our priorities have been, and I quote, drinking beer and watching soap operas. Here's another one. The world will end on December 21st, 2012. Remember the big hoopla over the Mayan apocalypse? Yeah, well, that didn't happen, did it? Finally, here's the best one, I think. Apple is not interested in cell phones. In 2006, David Pogue wrote in the New York Times that Apple would probably never come out with a cell phone. And soon after that, in 2007, Apple introduced their iPhone. It's been predicted that by next year, 2020, 80% of the world's adults, not just U.S., worldwide, 80% of the worldwide adults will have a cell phone in their pocket. So I guess we'll have to wait until next year to see if that one comes true. With such widespread failures to predict the future accurately, what are we to make of Joel's expectation that the day of the Lord is coming? It is near. This prophet of Israel called for national repentance, warning that a great locust plague was the sign of the beginning of the judgment of God. Now, Joel's prediction was not an error. In ancient Israel, Joel looked around and saw a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Locusts were covering the land like blackness spread upon the mountains. And these devouring insects were like a great and powerful army and Joel predicted that their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after in ages to come. So in ancient Israel, the day of the Lord was preceded by locusts. But the specific nature of the plague isn't what mattered. The national disaster could have been anything. It could have been frogs. It could have been gnats, flies, boils, hail whatever would get the attention of the people. What mattered to Joel was that the people would respond with repentance and prayer. And the same is true today. The power of the day of the Lord is that it grabs our attention and it offers us the possibility of transformation. 
as we enter into this season of Lent, let's shift our focus from the outside to the inside and begin to look at inner changes rather than outer changes. And we can do this using the guidance of Joel, who predicts that our lives will be transformed when we make the choice to return, learn, gather, and pray. First, we return to the God who says, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. To return to God is to repent, to turn around and go in a new and an opposite direction. When we repent, we turn to the path that God has laid out for us so that we are living a life that is different from before. Novelist and poem, excuse me, poet Ron Rash says that he is fascinated by the duality of human beings, the capacity for evil as well as the capacity for goodness. Evil always rises up, he says, and yet there are always people who fight against it. I'm fascinated by the war between what is best in our natures and what is worse. When we repent, we fight against evil and we turn away from what is the worst in our natures. We return to God and we turn to what is good. We turn toward what is best in our natures. This fight against evil can feel like a war, but with God's help, we can win it. After returning, we learn about the nature of our God, one who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Today, there's a lot of confusion about the nature of God. In the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings, the God of Israel speaks through a zealous, wrathful, 11-year-old British boy, a boy whom only Moses can see. And the boy is harsh in attitude and word, which fits what many people think of when they think of God of the Old Testament. A rabbi who watched the movie said that the boy, quote, behaves like he deserves a good thrashing. He's not into freedom, compassion, or justice, just into forcing compliance through demonstrations of power. And that's what a lot of people think about God, that he's just standing there waiting to zap us when we do wrong. The true God of Israel is very different. In the Bible, both Moses and Joel discover that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In fact, these are the words that are used to describe God after the people of Israel sin by making a golden calf. And Moses become angry becomes angry and he breaks the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. Exodus reveals that the Lord is not wrathful and harsh in word and attitude. God is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. All of those are working for good in our lives. On the day of the Lord, we return to God in repentance and we learn about the Lord's true nature. And then we gather as God's people, knowing that a transformed life must be lived in community. Blow the trumpet in Zion says Joel, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, 
assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Gregory Boyd is a pastor who describes himself as an introvert and naturally likes to retreat into his cave and read books. But over the years, he's, he's discovered that he really needs to be with people. He's now a part of an extended group of about 30 people, including their children and some younger friends. And he says, once a week, our group gets together to pray, worship, minister to people in our neighborhood, go to movies, play games, go out to dinner, dance, or just hang out. They have also started a ministry for impoverished children in Haiti. We are made in the image of the triune God, whose essence is loving community. Boyd says, we are created for community. This is how Jesus lived, and it's how his followers are called to live. So when Joel says to call a, a solemn assembly, gather the people, he's stressing that we are created for community. Each of us is made in the image of God who is, in God's own self, a sacred community made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And finally, after returning, learning, gathering in community, we pray. Between the vestibule and the altar, Joel calls for the ministers to pray. Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. That kind of prayer is called an intercession, asking God to act in the lives of others. In this passage from Joel, the ministers are asking God to save the people, but other prayers of intercession can request healing, strength, peace, or help. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul says that intercessions should be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. He says that we do this because God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. At the end of the day, we are supposed to pray. We pray for ourselves and for others, asking God to heal us and to help us so that we can lead peaceable lives and come to the knowledge of God's truth. Instead of feeling dismay, instead of feeling discouragement, we pray. We pray for God to transform us into the people that he wants us to be. So let's begin the season of Lent by embracing Joel's prediction that the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. If this day motivates us to return, learn, gather, and pray, it will be a good prediction, one that leads to real change for the better. Amen.